A story by Sandy Le M. Shengu. From U Ubuntu, Pty. The Royal Private Travel Diary and a Pilgrimage. Greetings, bonjour, sanabanani and welcome to the very special broadcast, as we travel down memory lane. The Travel Diaries of Empress Eugenie of France to Durban, Zululand, in South Africa, 1880. As she tours the land of the Zulu people now known as KwaZulu. Not tall. On the 1st of June 1879, while serving as an observer staff on the British War Colonial Mission under Lieutenant General Lord Shelmsford, the officer commanding the British forces, the only child of the late Napoleon III Prince Imperial of France had been killed in Zululand. In the story contents, we learn of intentions and objectives of the journey. Personal Diary, Diplomacy, Ambitions of Travels with Empress Eugenie's Visits to Zululand. KwaZulu Natal. Secondly we learn of the godmother of the fallen Prince Imperial Louis. Napoleon, Her Majesty Queen Victoria's support and her compassionate role in the travels in subsequent erection of the prince's final place of memory. In 1880 after the death of his imperial prince of France Louis Napoleon Bonaparte's in Zululand in 1879, Empress Eugenie undertook a pilgrimage tour into Zululand, to the site of the death of her son, the Prince Imperial of France. As early as September 1879, Eugenie had confided her plan of going out to see the spot where her son fell. All the royal visitors from Prince Alfred in 1860 to King George VI in 1947 who toured through what is now the South African province of KwaZulu Natal were descended from Queen Victoria. With one exception, she was the exiled and widowed Empress Eugenie of France, and even then, the purpose of her journey was identical with that of Queen Victoria's daughter Helena. The Princess Christian of Schleswig Holstein Sonderburg Augustenburg, who traveled through Natal in 1904 on the way to Pretoria to visit the grave of her son, Major Prince Christian Victor Chrysal, who had died in 1900 of typhoid fever during the Anglo War pilgrimage not to the grave but to the place in Zululand where, the year before, on the 1st of June 1879, her only child, Louis Napoleon, the exiled Prince Imperial of France, had been killed in a minor skirmish near the Tichotchassi River while serving as an observer on the staff of Lieutenant General Lord Shelmsford. The officer commanding the British forces invading those people close to the exiled Empress, who saw her utterly prostrated when on the 20th of June 1879 they brought her. The news of the death 19 days earlier of her son and the best hope of those working to restore the Bonapartes to the French throne, thought she would not long survive the devastating blow. Certainly, she did not think so herself. Nevertheless, she lived on a further 41 years, long enough to wish at the time of her 94th and last birthday in 1920 that she could have a flight in an aeroplane. She was, in fact, as this plucky desire demonstrates, an intrepid and the empress. Eugenie in deep venturesome woman of great strength of character engulfed her. The prince's body had been brought back to England and buried on 12 July 1879, but the empress felt she must visit Zululand, not only to secure the place where her son had fallen, but to collect all the details relating to his last moments. That way she not only would be able to reconstruct to her own satisfaction the final scene in the exact surroundings where it had been played but would be equipped to reassure the adherents of the Bonapartist cause that the imperial pretender had died as befitted a soldier in the military tradition of his dynasty. As she wrote to her secretary, Franceschini Pietri, I feel myself drawn towards this pilgrimage as strongly as the disciples of Christ must have felt drawn towards the holy places. The thought of seeing, of retracing the stages of my beloved son's last journey, of seeing with my own eyes the scene upon which his dying 
Gaze has rested, of passing the anniversary of the first June watching and praying alone with his. Memory, is for me a spiritual necessity and an aim in life. Her Majesty, Queen Victoria, who remembered the Empress in her glory and pitied her fallen state, remained a true friend and great solace. She sentimentally supported the idea of a pilgrimage had she not made a cult of the memory of her own beloved prince consort, and paid for the expedition, while the British government, internationally embarrassed by the prince's death and the scandal of his being left in the lurch by a British officer offered every facility for Eugenie in accordance journey. with Eugenie's wish. The Empress was accompanied by Brigadier, General, Sir, Evelyn Wood, KCB, VC, who had successfully commanded the left and flying columns during the Anglo-Zulu War, and his wife, Paulina, Lady Wood. As early as September 1879, Eugenie had confided to Wood her plan of going out to see the spot where her son fell. Wood, only too aware of the rigors of such a journey, had then done his best to dissuade her, but had declared his willingness to accompany the Empress to Zululand should the Queen approve, the Marquis de Bassano, the son of her chamberlain, the Duc de Bassano, was also of the party, as was Surgeon Major Frederick Scott who had served on Shelmsford's personal staff and who, as medical officer in charge of headquarter, had examined the prince's body where it had fallen. They were joined by the Honorable Mrs. Ronald Campbell. She was born Catherine Clotton, the daughter of the Bishop of St. Albans, and was the widow captain the Honorable Ronald Campbell, Coldstream Guards, the second son of the Earl of Cawdor. He had been Wood's principal stat officer and close friend in. Had fallen by his side in the 11 executed assault on Holobane Mountain on 28 March 1879. His death. Had left Wood with a burden of remorse, and Eugenie agreed to make a detour in Zululand to allow. Mrs. Campbell to visit her husband's grave. Two Royal Artillery officers who had served with distinction with No. 11 Battery, 7th Brigade with Wood's Column during the Anglo-Zulu War, and who had been friends and comrades of the Prince, he was trained as an artilleryman in the tradition of the Great Napoleon at the Royal Military Academy, Woolwich, completed the suite. They were Captain E.G. Slade and Captain Arthur Big. A complete establishment of servants accompanied them. Captain Big went ahead to Cape Town to prepare for Eugenie's arrival, landing there on the 2nd of April, 1880. However, Queen Victoria intended him to be more than simply the expedition's glorified quartermaster. She entrusted him with a special and confidential role in the entourage, he was to be nothing less than the Queen's eyes and ears, and she commanded him to inform her of its progress. He evidently fulfilled this delicate role to her entire satisfaction, for upon his return from South Africa he was appointed assistant to Sir Henry Ponsonby, the principal private secretary to the Queen, and succeeded him in 1895. Other members of the Empress's suite also reported his regular duty reports which them. provided her with the fullest picture before she left for South Africa, on 6 March 1880 Eugenie returned Queen Victoria the letters her sympathetic, royal friend, had written to her since the death of her son, and entrusted her with a small, sealed packet to be opened in the case of her death, forsake Victoria carried the packet about with her everywhere while was away. On her return, Eugenie insisted that the Queen open it and keep the contents, which turned out to be a splendid emerald cross, cut off a single stone without any joins, and set at the points with fine diamonds. It had been given to Eugenie by the King of Spain. In 1853 when she married Napoleon III, and she had been keeping it to the future wife of her son. Arrangements for special accommodation on board ship having been made as in January 1880, the 
party embarked at Southampton on 25 March 1880 on the Union Steamship Company's German Witch, since her first voyage in 1877, had established a high reputation for eugenic travel incognito as Comtesse de Pierre Fonce. To ensure her comfort and privacy, three first-class cabins on the port side were set aside dot for her exclusive use as a drawing room, bedroom and bathroom. They were fitted and upholstered in an exceedingly tasteful manner, being hung with silver-gray silk rope and splendid mirrors and furnished with an exquisite writing table in black and gold and other fit. For an empress, a crown was painted on the drawing room door. Her suite occupied five other cabins. During the voyage she was more cheerful than at any time since the prince's death. Chatting with the officers of her party and infancy needlework on deck with her ladies, even though she found the heat oppressive and the voyage most wearisome. In all, Eugenie's health, as Lady Wood reported to the Queen, much improved on the voyage, although she grew a good deal thinner, however. By the time the German docked in Cape Town on 16 April, the realization that she was about to view scenes once familiar to her son began sorely to oppress the at government house in Cape Town, where the prince had also stayed the a year before, she avoided company and kept herself to the garden. Nevertheless, as the governor of the Sir Bartle Frere, wrote to the Prince of Wales, although she liked to lead the conversation to anything relating to the poor Prince Imperial, and is often in tears when telling us about him, she managed to take a great interest in other things, especially in politics. Not that Frere himself was in the mood to provide good company. His machinations had initiated the disastrous Anglo-Zulu War, and his reputation as an administrator was in tatters in consequence. In August 1880 he would be recalled, his brilliant career over and his high hopes of a peerage dashed in or scoff's opinion, was continuing to improve greatly in, in health April, and spirits. She embarked on the German for Durban. She arrived there on the 23rd of April to be by large crowds. Before disembarking she presented Captain Coxwell of the German with a handsome breastpin as a memento of the voyage, and each of the officers with a photograph of herself. In Durban the Empress stayed in the same rooms in Captain and Mrs. Banton's house which the Prince had occupied. She was much in tears despite the kind attention of Lieutenant General Sir Garnet Wolseley who was on his way back to England having, only two days previously on the 21st of April, been succeeded as High Commissioner for Southeast Africa and Governor of Natal by Sir George Pomeroy Colley. It was while in Durban that she had an encounter which betrayed her deep-seated apprehensions and abiding sense of horror in her son's death, and which gave Wood serious cause for concern. He reported the disquieting incident to the Queen. We passed three black men running, and the Empress gave a start, and a look of terror which made me anxious for her in Zululand. She shuddered crying and quat, ce sont, de Zulus and quat, I shall of course be very careful not to let any Zulus approach her suddenly, but, I fear she will be greatly distressed on first seeing them. The Empress and her suite departed for Pietermaritzburg as rapidly as they could, which meant on the first leg of the journey taking the train as far as it went. A regular train service between Durban and Botha's Hill had only been inaugurated on 24 March 1879, and the difficult stretch in the vicinity of Inchonga, where nine Iron girder bridges and a short tunnel were required but had still to be completed. Thus it was not until 21 October 1880 that the rails finally reached Pietermaritzburg, and the Empress had to alight at the end of the line 35 miles from Durban at Bolton's Creek, where a makeshift platform had been hurriedly completed only 48 hours before. Escorted by the natal mounted police, Eugenie proceeded the rest of the way to Pietermaritzburg by carriage. In the colonial capital, the Empress was 
touched by the character of the crowds who maintained a respectful silence similar to that which one tries to maintain in a sick room, while the men uncovered their heads and the women curtsied. However, all this studiously followed decorum was ruined by boys and men of the lower classes who broke through the lines and rode up close to the empress's carriage, staring in a most vulgar manner, into it. She stayed at government house where the prince had also lodged, and a constable and an orderly were stationed at the entrance to prevent the public from entering the grounds, though no one was so crass as to make the attempt. Determined to tread in her son's footsteps. She walked as he had done the short way from Government House in Longmarket Street to St. Mary's Roman Catholic Chapel in Loop Street. At the convent next door, she visited the Holy Family. Sisters who had prayed over her son's remains while he lay in state in St. Mary's, expressing her gratitude with a lot convent with the Mother Superior she broke down utterly, nor was it surprising that she did suffer, as Big had put it when explaining to the Queen why Eugenie, despite the wishes of the local Roman Catholics, could never have stayed within the convents. Walls, it was there that the ghastly operation of identifying and changing the body from one coffin to another was carried out, while in the city the Empress assisted at Mass in the private chapel of Bishop Charles Jolivet, and visited the various Catholic schools where she presented pupils with little gifts and photographs of the prince. Although deeply affected, she carried out these duties in an affable and approachable manner. The mayor, Peter Davis, whose firm, P. Davis and Sons, was the colony's leading printers and the owner of the Natal Witness newspaper, was granted a long interview, during which Eugenie made a point of expressing her sympathy over his son, Trooper Harry Davis of the Natal Carboneers who, at the age of 20, had been killed at the Battle of I Sand Lewana. The Prince Imperial had been only 23 years old. The Empress left Peter Maritzburg quietly and unostentatiously on the 29th of April, and it took her 26 days to reach T. Schotz Hosi River. She traveled in a spider carriage drawn by four rather than the normal two horses, with either Lady Wood or with Mrs. Campbell as companion. Wood himself drove. The spider was the South African version of the American buggy, so-called because the light, small body of the carriage, slung on four disproportionately large but slender wheels, gave a distinctly spidery impression. But it was a comfortable vehicle, and its high wheels were good for negotiating rivers and drifts. The spider and its occupants were escorted by a guard of honor of 20 Natal mounted police under SGT Fatty. The whole party, including cooks, servants and wagon drivers, numbered 75 persons besides 200 horses, mules and other animals, most of which had been supplied by the Natal government. This caravan never traveled less than 12 miles a day, which was good. Going considering its size and the rough state of the dirt tracks but, as Big replied to the Queen, the Empress complained of the slowness of her progress, though the moment she reached places visited by the Prince she became much less sights restless. by the road, and setting out early each morning to avoid the heat of the day, the party traveled north by way of Greytown, Mui River, Umsinger, Helpmakar, Dundee, Landman's Drift, Utrecht and Conference Hill to Karmbula Hill. At these places Eugenie visited every site whether camp, logger or house that was associated with the prince. At a small roadside inn at Mui River on the 4th of May the Empress was again, as she had been in Durban, thrown into emotional turmoil when confronted by a party of Zulu. Big described the encounter to Queen Victoria. Suddenly the well-known cry of respectful greeting and quad, Inkosikazi and Kwat, was heard in. A body of about 50 natives carrying assegais and sticks appeared poor empress, as we who know her. 
best anticipated, the first sight of the Asagai caused her great emotion and it was truly a sad scene, she overwhelmed with grief with these almost naked natives sitting in a semicircle before her ignorant of the sorrow caused by their presence. However, it was best, Big reflected, that the inevitable trial of coming face to face with Zulu armed with the very sort of weapons that had killed the prince should be got over at Landman's Drift in Melmoth, Osborne, the British resident in Zululand, who presided ineffectually over the thirteen weak but quarrelsome chiefdoms into which the British had fragmented the once powerful Zulu kingdom after their victory in the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879, was waiting on Sir Garnet Wolseley's orders to accompany the Empress through Zululand. But, as Big explained to the Queen, Eugenie did not wish any strangers to join her party, so Osborne returned rather ignominiously to his station. In any case, the Empress was not ready yet to head east for Zululand and the Tishatshasi River. Not only were there still places in the Transvaal associated with her son to visit, but she had undertaken to go on to Holobane so that Mrs. Campbell could place her tribute on her husband's grave. So when on the 8th of May her party crossed over the Blood River Enkum at Landman's Drift into the former Transvaal colony, it turned north towards Utrecht, ostensibly to avoid unnecessary public demonstrations handled Sir Owen Lanyon the administrator of the Transvaal, as she had Osborne, and turned down his dutiful offer to escort her over the Transvaal border? The Empress travelled to Utrecht by way of Baltz Bruit on the 11th of May. There she visited the house where the Prince had stayed, and had lunch with Gerhardus Rudolf, the Landrost of Utrecht who was held in some suspicion by his fellow Boers for his pro-British stance. On the 12th stance. of May she saw a fort built in May 1879 at Conference Hill named Napoleon, in her son's honor. I and finally crossed the Blood River, Enkum into the province of Zululand on 13 May, reaching Karmbula Hill the following day. At Karmembula on the 16th of May, Wood proudly showed Empress where, on the 29th of March in 1879, he had broken the Zulu army in the decisive battle of the Anglo-Zulu War. Both and Slade had gallantly fought their guns in the same action. Woods you must have been rather different on the 21st of May when he rode and walked up the eastern end of Lebane Mountain with the Empress and Mrs. Campbell. That had been a disastrous affray, and Wood was fortunate that the Battle of Karmbula the next day had effectively obliterated criticism of his unquestionably inept generalship on the 28th of March 1879. The party retraced his route on the day of the battle, and Wood supervised the erection of a stone headstone for Mrs. Campbell's husband to replace the wooden headboard erected by the family of Llewellyn Lloyd, Wood's political assistant in 1879 who had fallen in the same engagement and been buried alongside Campbell from the moment. Expedition had left Pietermaritzburg, the ladies dressed in white helmets and dust coats, and wore top boots and skirts made somewhat shorter than usual as a precaution against snakebite. The Empress continued volatile, seemed a big at times bright and cheerful but oftentimes sorely depressed. She was sleeping badly. At times she sat in her tent, reading and re-reading letters written to her by her son, at others she walked miles in the evening after the party had taken a break for the night. She was torn between impatience to arrive at the Tishotes Hoshi River and dread at what awaited her. For some days she suffered from a fever which reached its height in bitterly cold weather at Karmbula where her wonderfully arranged tent was nearly swept away in heavy rain and winds, generally, though, the Empress was happier than when she had been subjected to the curious stares from the crowds in Cape Town, Durban and Pietermaritzburg. Unavoidably, however, her Zululand pilgrimage was newsworthy, and she was hard put to evade a sensationalist in 
tenacious woman writer and correspondent for the New York Herald who went by the name of Lady Avonmore. This journalist had arrived in Natal, big indignantly explained to the Queen, with the intention of writing a biography of the Prince Imperial, and she wanted an emulation of the Empress to visit the sites associated with him. That was intrusive enough, but she unpardonably claimed to be a dear friend of the Empress and personally known to her, insisting on being allowed to join her to testify her sympathy and affection. Eugenie had never heard of the importunate journalist and would have nothing to do with her, since Sir Bartle Frere was determined to secure the Empress from intrusions by journalists, a heavyweight deputation consisting of Wood and the Natal Colonial Secretary, Lt. Call C. B. H. Mitchell, intervened in an attempt to head Lady Avonmore off in Durban and to dissuade her from starting in pursuit of Eugenie. Undeterred, she traveled north to Rourke's Drift on the Buffalo, Mazinyathi River, and Big had then to make a special expedition south all the way from the camp at Moonla. Hill, midway between Kambula and the Tishotes Hoshi River, to eat her off. Adept at dissimulation, she persuaded the Honorable Big that she would desist, but, as events were to prove, had no intention of keeping her lightly of given word. Eugenie at last. reached the Tishotes Hoshi River from Kambula by way of Moonla Hill, very much. The Root Woods Flying Column had followed in May 1879, and a part of Zulu land the Prince had participated in reconnoitering. Wood telegraphed Queen Victoria of her safe arrival, reporting, she was as well as could be expected. The empathetic Queen understood Eugenie's likely state of mind and commented in her journal, under such mental trials, poor dear Empress, it must be too awful, indeed, it must have been. For a week the grief-stricken Eugenie stayed at the T-Shotes Hoshi, sleeping badly, sustaining herself with beef tea and little else, and praying on the spot where her son had fallen. She walked up and down the path from Sobuz's homestead where, on the fatal day, the prince and his patrol had dismounted and refreshed themselves, and where her tent was pitched, onto the dinga where the prince, unable to mount his horse and cravenly abandoned by his companions, had been speared to death by the Zulu party who had ambushed them. Unhappily, the empress was, as the Marquis of Bassano reported, disappointed with her impression of the spot where her son had died. Several well-meaning British efforts to tidy it up had made it resemble in its orderliness more an English graveyard than the wild and romantic scene of carnage. Eugenie had imagined, initially, men of the first the King's Dragoon Guards, who had recovered the Prince's body on the day following his death, had built a small stone cairn over the place where the Prince's stripped, stabbed and ritually slit body had lain. The two halves first regiment Royal Scots. Fusiliers who, like the Dragoon Guards, were part of the 2nd Division invading Zululand, had subsequently erected a temporary wooden board on the site commemorating the Prince's death. Then, in preparation for the Empress's visit, Sir Garnet Wolseley had dispatched a party of commissariat. Men and horses commanded by Major Henry Spark Stab, 32nd Foot who had fought at the Battle of Ulundi and who had remained in Natal as president of a board investigating and settling claims made by the colonists for losses suffered during the Anglo-Zulu War, to make a determined assault on the site between 18 and 29 March. Behind the stab's men erected a stone cross made by Jesse Smith of 25 Loop Street, Peter Mleritzburg, the colony's leading stonemason, at a cost of £35.12.5 d, to replace the 21st Regiment's board and settled it firmly in a broad foundation of concrete. In doing so, they were following Queen Victoria's specific instructions for, as Stab expressed it in his full report on the expedition, Her Majesty desired the cross to be placed to mark the spot. 
where the prince fell this private and personal act of the queen, as Sir Henry Ponsonby characterized it, unfortunately caused some annoyance in natal circles. The prickly colonial authorities considered themselves snubbed and believed that they ought to have been, officially, entrusted with the work instead of the queen commissioning Lady Frere to do it privately on her behalf having placed the cross, which Big in his report on the expedition to the Queen referred to as, Your Majesty's Memorial Cross, Stab's work party, to prevent the summer rains washing their handiwork away, used dynamite to redirect the, the course and touches, the they planted a few, hardy trees, obtained from Peter Maritzburg Botanical Gardens and built a stone wall to surround the whole site. To the Empress, who had imagined that she would see the vestiges of the grass trodden by her son in his dying moments, it was a dreadful blow to find the concrete layer in the very soil of the wall carefully raked for her inspection. Understanding her dismayed response, Captain Slade removed the of concrete which so offended her and restored the site to something closer to the natural terrain that had nourished in her mind's eye. In accordance with her own conception of how the place where her son had died should be embellished, the Empress planted the willow and ivy she had brought from Camden Place. The house at Chislehurst which, since September 1870, had been the home in exile for herself and her son, and where Napoleon III had died on 9 January 1873. While at the Tishat Chassis River the Empress could not sleep for, as she told Pietri in a letter of 30 May, her soul was, full of bitterness and sorrow. She could only find some peace when near the spot where the prince had fallen. On the afternoon of 31 May she insisted on finding the site the prince had selected during the course of his fatal patrol for the next camp of the advancing 2nd Division, and where he had made his last sketch. The place was three hours away on foot but, as Bassano who accompanied her reported, she walked with a sort of feverish strength, eating absolutely nothing the way on horseback and in the company of Wood and the other officers, also crossed the Dinga through which Lieutenant Carey and the survivors of the patrol had galloped on the 1st of June 1879. She was overwhelmed with bitterness when she contemplated how Carey had so obviously and cravenly left her precious son to be so wantonly sacrificed. One of the Empress's main purposes in visiting Zulu land now known as KwaZulu Natal was to gain definitive proof for herself and her followers that her son had died a brave and gallant soldier in the Bonapartist tradition to which he was heir. However, she could not bear to see any of the Zulu who had been involved in the fatal skirmish, so while she communed with her son's memory in the vicinity of the Dinga where the prince had died, Wood took the opportunity between the 26th of May and I June to examine 13 of the Zulu involved, inducing them to testify, Big informed the Queen with presents of blankets, beads and money. Later on the return journey from Zululand, Wood elicited a statement from a 14th Zulu in the Batshe Valley near E. Sandlawana on 3 June, and from a 15th in Durban on 24 June. By command of Queen Victoria, the, the statements were kept evidence was remarkably consistent, and Wood was able to assure the Empress and proud mother that without the shadow of a doubt her son had indeed stood his ground and, in the words of Longarlibelele, who had seen him fall, fought like a lion, but this knowledge was in itself bitter. She could not restrain herself when giving vent to her anguish in a letter to Pietri. On the 30th of May from deploring most ungraciously that the only witnesses to her son's courage were and quat, a handful of savages one degree removed from the brute. The evidence collected by Wood also had the unfortunate effect, as had earlier the sanitized condition of the Dinga wall where the prince had been killed, of cruelly dispelling a romantic image that the empress had formed in her.
own mind. She had imagined her son lying dead with his sword in his hand and was considerably taken. Aback when Wood told her that the prince had evidently lost his sword in the melee, and had fought to the end with his revolver and a spear seized from his foes. Slade found it difficult to persuade her that it was actually braver for him to have stoutly defend himself in that way than with his own sword. Ironically, as the dread day of the anniversary of her son's death finally dawned, the shameless Lady Avonmore had the beneficial effect of taking the Empress's mind off the prince for a few moments. On the 1st of June, she camped five miles from the Empress, and Wood, Bassano and Big went across determined to see her off on this, of all days. As she was full of lies and evasions that were remorselessly exposed as such at every turn, but everyone remained civil, and she agreed finally to keep her distance, but not before quite astonishing Big with her audacity. The Empress, marked the anniversary of her son's death by passing the whole night of 1 to the 2nd of June in prayer by the cairn. Speaking of it later, she clearly believed it had been a mystical experience. More than once I noticed black fawns on the top of the banks, which moved silently about and watched me through the tall grasses. This scrutiny was full of curiosity, but it was not hostile. I believe these savages wished rather to express their sympathy and their pity. Dot dot dot. And. Doubtless these were the very same men who had killed my son on the same spot. Towards morning a. Strange thing happened. Although there was not a breath of air, the flames of the candles were. Suddenly deflected, as if someone wished to extinguish them, and I said to him, and quat, is it indeed. You beside me. Do you wish me to go away? Once the fatal anniversary had passed, the Empress was anxious to be gone, though suffering from an attack of sciatica brought on by the strain in cold of her vigil. On the 3rd of June the party moved south to encamp at the Bache River while the Empress inspected the countryside which had been sketched by the Prince when out on patrol in late May 1880. The next bivouac was formed on the 5th of June at the battlefield of I Sanlawana, half a mile away from the stricken British Camp 01, the 22nd of January 1879, where some of the bones of the British dead still lay unburied, despite the efforts of several burial parties they over the preceding that they months. stop and spend a day covering the poor remains with earth, and for two hours herself took part in the work. The Empress and her party pressed forward on the 8th of June to Rourke's Drift where they crossed back into Natal from Zululand. Her mission accomplished, the Empress allowed herself to sink into a deep depression and was very irritable to her companions. Wood reported to the Queen on the 10th of June that over the previous three days Eugenie had been, very low and desponding, and had ceased to eat. But the journey had to continue, by way of escort where, on the 6th of June, she paid a visit to Major General B.P. Lloyd, who had been in command of Colonial Defensive District No. 2 during the Anglo-Zulu on Mihawa, the Empress's party regained Petermaritzburg on the 19th of June. Seemingly well but slightly sunburned so the local newspaper commented. Usually stayed less than two at Government House. Outside the main gates, in Longmarket Street, a tent was erected in which the leading residents of the city could enter their names in a visitor's book. On the Sunday she attended mass celebrated by Bishop Jolliver. Afterwards, at her request, she had an interview over several hours with John Colenso, the first Anglican bishop of Natal. His unorthodox theology had led to his excommunication and his schism in the Anglican community, and his protests against the unjustness of the Anglo-Zulu War had brought him into conflict with the military authorities and with many colonists. But he was a man of immense character, learning and integrity, and it says well for the Empress that she wanted to meet him. Despite the disapproval this must have occasioned in many local colonial circles. On Monday, 21 
June Wood drove the Empress and Lady Wood from Peter Maritzburg to Bacchus Hill, the terminus of Railway back to Durban. Wood had barely stopped one head on his way back after taking leave of the Empress. When the connecting rod which fastened the fourth carriage to the after part of the spider snapped in. 2. Fortunately for Wood, the horses were only going at a steady trot, but if he had been cantering as he had been earlier with the Empress, who liked to travel fast, she most likely would have suffered a dangerous accident. In Durban usually spent the night in the home of her sympathetic danger, where she had stopped on the way to Julian before embarking on the Asiatic. The next morning, then shipping the AIGOA Bay on the 26th of June to the Union Company's steamship Dragon. Queen Victoria, her empathetic friend who had exercised her royal influence to marshal the support necessary to ease and finance Eugenia's every step on. Her pilgrimage to Julia her wings were undramatic and deeply felt, thanked most heartily for. Conscientiously, a few days after the first anniversary of her pilgrimage on Pivot June. 1881, a more collected empress wrote the word, gratefully thanking him for his kindness and sympathy, and for all the trouble he had taken in making her journey to the Peachhead Safety River. Possible, he concluded sadly of the children and fed in thought, although, sorry, it was some consolation in my everlasting sorrow to the end.